Today's episode is brought to you by the book From Compton to Congress, His Grace for My Race by Walter R. Tucker III. I am super excited to share this book with you because it's the January Mocha Girls Read Book of the Month. From Compton to Congress reveals shocking criminal charges based on an FBI sting that sends Congressman Walter R. Tucker III reeling and changes his life forever. Tucker's choice to fight these charges against him thrusts him into a criminal trial that tests the condition of his human spirit and provokes us to reflect on every man's plight versus every man's fight. From Compton to Congress, it's available from Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Learn more by visiting mochagirlsread.com. everyone, this is Tamara from ShelfAddiction.com and welcome to episode 166. Tonight on Book Chat, I am interviewing author Jen Castleberry. Jen Castleberry resides in Virginia Beach with her husband and pets. Her background is in communications and animal welfare. And a fun fact for you, all of her pets are named after superheroes. Hang out with us to hear Jen's recommendations on her current top binge-worthy reads, and also she'll introduce us to her book, A Wild and Unremarkable Thing. Jen's social media links are below in the show notes, so if you'd like to connect, you know where to find her. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like and share it. Show your support by rating the podcast and leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or your listening app of choice. If you'd like to comment on something you hear during today's episode, you can find me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. If you'd like to email in feedback or questions, feel free to reach out to me at info at shelfaddiction.com or call in and leave an internet voice message via SpeakPipe or the Anchor app. The links are below in the show notes. Hey, Jennifer, thank you for joining me tonight. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. I'm really excited for tonight because as book lovers, I know we both binge a book or 50. <laughs> 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 yes, so I thought you were the perfect person to recommend some binge-worthy young adult titles. Oh, yes. I am so into young adult, and I am like on a binge reading just go right now. I've been reading so many books. I'm really excited for this topic. Yay, I'm excited too. So tell me, did you find it hard to narrow down your list? Um, yes, I found it really hard. <laughs> I was going through my uh, bookshelves and I was like, okay, which of these books have I really read in just a sitting or two? And there were so many good ones, especially in recent years where YA has just exploded with so many great new authors. And uh, so I really had to figure out which which ones to talk about because there's just so many books on the market right now that are so good that you can just fly through and they're also different. Yeah, I totally agree with you because, and it does come in like waves for me. Like I'll find in a couple of months, I'm just devour, devouring them like no one's business. <laughs> and then like the next six months, I'm like, oh, there's nothing good out, you know? Yes, that, bl- that book slump, the struggle is real. I hate that. But it's so good when you get into a good, like everything you're reading is great. So it kind of balances itself out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess it gives you a little, gives your, your eyes a rest and then you can pick it up. <laughs> or maybe you can like catch up on some laundry or something. <laughs> yeah, like do real world stuff. <laughs> Who wants like to your do friends that? think you died, but no, yeah. you're just having a great reading go. <laughs> exactly. Well, I really like your um, list. Um, I see you have a good mix of genres. So yeah. everyone that's listening, Jennifer has picked some really cool ones. So there's something for everyone here. So I think so. I tried to pick them across genres and I do really, I have my favorite genres, but I try and read across genres because there's just so much great stuff out there. And and I try not to just stick in one section of the bookstore. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I totally feel that because I'm the same way. I do have my favorites, but it's very good to kind of stretch your you know, your feelers out there and try some other genres because you can find some amazing books if you get out of that box, right? Yeah, 
Yes. And that's why like the podcast and going on Tumblr and like having other friends in the in the reading community that you know has similar taste to you. That's been huge for me to figure out what I should try next. Um, I used to really uh, reread a lot of the same books over and over again. And now I don't even really have time to do that because there's so many on my TBR that I have yet to read. <laughs> I don't have time to reread things. <laughs> that is so funny. I'm like, who has time to reread? There's so many books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I understand. We're on the same page. So let's jump into them because we have five really good ones. So let's start off with your, let's number them for fun. So like number five, we can start with number five and then okay. end with number one, number one being your, your highest recommendation. Oh, let's do it that okay. way. Okay, well, now I'm going to have to think a little bit, but I'll say for my number five, I'm going to say um, Everything, Everything by Nicola Yoon, which is a contemporary YA. And if you haven't, if you're unaware that it started as a book, it did release as a movie this year. So you may have seen the movie or seen the trailer for that. <laughs> yes, you know what? I saw the movie. Now, I did not read this book, but I did pick up her other book, which is The Sun is Also a Star. Yes, I and have I- it on my bookshelf right now, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> yeah. And I did see the movie and the movie was amazing. So you guys know the book is always better. So just imagine how good this book is going to be if you've seen the movie. The book is so good. It's got that kind of um, like mixed media vibe that if you've read like Illuminae or those that like mixed text messages and graphs and things into the book, it has that. And um, if you haven't seen the, the movie or read the book, it's about a girl who basically has like bubble boy syndrome uh, where she's has these severe allergies and she has she's been pretty much confined to her house uh, her entire life her house is kind of set up to filter out all kinds of environmental allergens um, and she's kind of hitting a time in her life where she knows that girls her age are going off to college or are starting to you know take a year off and explore the world and she's looking at her life as being just kind of everything in her future is looks exactly like everything in her past she's just going to be mm-hmm. in the past for her whole life and it's mm-hmm. really it's it's um, a strange situation, but it resonated so much with me, that feeling of being a young person and feeling trapped and, and feeling like your life isn't really going anywhere exciting. And I, as I was reading it, I was wishing so much I could have read it when I was in high school or even in middle school, because emotionally, it really resonated with that kind of those memories for me. Yeah. Um, but it's great. Uh, you, It's got some great twists. I was a little disappointed with the movie trailer because I felt like it spoiled one of the biggest twists. Oh. Um, but <laughs> so if you haven't, if you have happened to not see the trailer and haven't read the book, I would say go read the book because it's amazing before you spoil it for yourself. Yeah. But it's still really, really good. One of my friends, uh, I got her to read the book after she'd seen the movie and she still said the book was just as good, even though she kind of already knew the, the twists and the ending. But it it is so good. I don't read a lot of contemporary books because I cry a lot anyway. And yeah. they just make me always cry. And this one definitely made me cry a lot, but it's really, really, really good. So I yeah. um, I definitely read that one in just a couple of sittings. I whipped right through it. Yeah. And I, you guys, the twist is killer. We oh! are not going to spoil it, but it's like, oh, really? Really it's now? So wow. good. And Nicola <laughs> Yoon, I'm pretty sure, I hope I'm not misspeaking but I'm pretty sure her husband did the illustrations in the book since it is mixed media um, but however I'll have to look back and, and check on that but however it was whoever is responsible for the illustrations they are done so well they're not just there to kind of be um, a cool extra thing like they pack a punch and they yeah. really are utilized well for the purposes of the the major twist because there's some, some other twists throughout it's not just one twist but there's one big one yeah. um, and my heart just stopped I know you know what I'm talking about Tamara <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's great so I definitely definitely recommend reading this one it's so good and I think it's um it's appropriate I think too for even a younger age I uh enjoyed it um being you know uh, in my 30s but I I think even like a, being in a middle schooler there's nothing really inappropriate in this book and and it's it's really really good yes Co-sign on that. Okay. (laughs) 
What's your oh, fourth right. choice? Number four. Okay, I'm going to say for number four, um, Caraval by Stephanie Garber, mm-hmm. which is a magical realism, kind of a fantasy. Uh, and I picked this one, one, because it's great. And two, because it's got a sequel that's releasing next year. So they just recently re- um, announced that the sequel is coming. And I was really, really excited. If you're someone who likes standalones, I think you'll still like this book, even though it's part of the uh, uh, series, because I didn't truly didn't know that it was going to have a sequel until like the last three pages of the book. So it wraps up very nicely. And then it just kind of sets it up for like almost a companion story, I feel like, um, with the next one. But it's the story of these two sisters who get invitations to go to this buy ticket only live action game called Caraval. And uh, they have to go to the secluded island to take place in the game. And takes place over the course of a week. And they've always wanted to go. They've been asking for tickets every year. They finally get them. Um, but the game is really sinister. No one in the who is playing the game knows if their fellow players are staff members or if they're just laymen playing the game. They don't know if what they're seeing is staged or real. And people have like gone insane in the course of the game because they just can't tell um, reality apart from fiction. And so you're in the, the mind of the main character and it gets more and more convoluted where you also can't tell what is real and what's not. And if you think people maybe are being murdered or kidnapped and you just don't know if it's real or not. Uh, mm-hmm. It's really, really well done. It sounds like you would just be completely confused the whole time you're reading, but you're not. You're just like flipping the pages like you can't believe it. Um, and and there's this like really great feeling of mystery. There's all these great magical elements. I think if you like are a Harry Potter fan, you'll really like it because the island is has all these cool magical elements that are really unique. And uh, it goes from being very like bright and colorful with great, pretty, um, just fanciful world building to being really dark and sinister and mysterious. And it's just really, really good. I like shouted out loud as I was reading this book, just like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Is it really happening? So oh, wow. it's really good. I had a lot of fun reading that one. Okay, so now you just bumped that up my TBR because I'm telling you, this has been on my TBR list for months and months. It's sitting on my shelf. And every time I look at it, I'm like, I want to read that book. But then something just drags me away. But now... I feel like, okay, I've got to pick this book up now. You have to read it. It's so good. I will say it took me about a chapter to get into the, um, how do I want to say this? Kind of the way she tells a story, like the, her voice as an author was a little bit different for me. Uh, mm-hmm. So it did take me um, maybe about a chapter to really get into that voice feeling natural in my head. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was so interesting. The way she describes things is really fun and really interesting that I stuck with it through that first chapter. And I'm really glad I did because the story itself is just so good. And it's just really special. It's really unique. I've never read a story where I really, truly felt like I was in this game. It was so good. (laughs) You know, on a side note, like it seems like games in books, like that's a theme that's been like really relevant, like prevalent lately. Like I'm seeing that a lot in lot more, way more than ever before now. Well, I want you to, if you uh, have recommendations for books like that, let me know because I love this one so much. I'd love to read more books that have this game style to them. It's so cool. Okay. Well, I'll definitely give you some <laughs> after because I have one on the tip of my tongue, but I'll save it for later because this is your list, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go on then with my, um, we're at number three now, yes. right? right? Okay. So for my number three, I've got Three Dark Crowns by Kendara Blake, um, which is a fantasy. They just released the sequel, which is uh, One one Dark Throne, I think is the sequel. I haven't got it yet just because I asked for it as a Christmas present. So I didn't want to pay for it out of my own pocket. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, but this one's really, really good. It's like all over uh, just kind of the reader community right now because the, the newest one just came out. But it's about um, 
These three uh, triplets, um, they are sister queens. And the way this world works is that the queen always has triplets. Each of these triplets uh, is born with a particular magical ability. Um, and one day, one of the triplets is going to become queen and then she'll have triplets and it'll go on on and so forth in, in that mm-hmm. kind of a way. Um, and then the world itself is split into three regions and each region encompasses people of a particular strain of magic. So the triplets get split up when they're kids. They're sent to the appropriate region as children. They're supposed to like develop their magical powers. And then at a certain age, I want to say like 16, they're brought together and they basically have a year to try to kill each other. And the last sister left standing will become the queen. Wow. <laughs> and whatever, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. And whatever <laughs> her magical strain of power is, that region will kind of be the governing region for the whole world. So the, the three regions have a lot of stock in in their queen. Um, and the first book is uh, kind of setting up the three girls in their, you know, separate worlds and bringing them together. They don't actually, a few people have, or I guess a lot of people have been a little disappointed because they felt like they were going to have this battle to the death in the first book. But the first book is more world building. And the second book is where they actually battle. But I loved it. I started, I started this book, um, when I was on vacation, I was flying to Nashville and I had a few connecting flights and I started it as I was waiting for my first flight. And by the time I reached Nashville, I finished it. It's that good. I read it that fast. Um, and I just like smiled the whole time I was reading it, even though it's really gruesome because it's so well done and it just sucks you in from like the very first page it's so good I cannot get enough of this book it's so good well that's good to know because honestly when I saw this book on the list I kind of was like really her now let me tell you why because I have I read okay I do have this book on my shelf it's sitting there (laughs) and let me tell you why I thought that because I read Anna Dressed in Blood right and I didn't love it. I mean, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it either. Let me and, tell you, my yeah. mother-in-law, I haven't read Anna Dressed in Blood yet. Um, that one I put on my TBR after reading this one because this is my first Kendara Blake book that I read. And I got my mother-in-law to read Three Dark Crowns. And when she was done, she was like, I need something else to read. I said, well, read uh, Anna Dressed in Blood. It's by the same author. I'm sure it's just as good. She said the same thing. She said it was extremely different and she yeah. liked it, but she didn't like it nearly as much as she liked Three Dark Crowns. So I think she um, may have just taken a very different approach to this series than to the Anna Dressed in Blood because my mother-in-law said that it was it was like reading a different author um, between wow. the two books. So give it a chance, even if you didn't okay. really like Anna, because it's really good. <laughs> okay, well, that makes me want to try it because, you know, I mean, maybe she's learned from, maybe she's just evolved since writing Anna Dressed in Blood. Yeah, because maybe, maybe she just yeah. wanted to try a different voice. I I don't know. I, I wish I had read that one so I could give a more kind of definitive. I know that that is not one told through a male perspective. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I actually had forgotten that I did read the second book. I read Girl of Nightmares reluctantly. And uh, I remember now. So I mean, I did love it. So like the second book was 2012. So that was some time ago. So yeah. definitely. So maybe she, she has evolved as an author yeah. in that time. Yeah. So, okay. I'm open to it. I'm not going to put poo on the suggestion. I'm open no, to it. <laughs> especially if you already have it on your shelf. It's really good. And I flew right through it. It's, um, it's very unique and it's very like action followed by action followed by action. There's not really any info dump. It's, uh, the perspective of all three sisters. So it kind of mm-hmm. hops between them. Um, and it's, uh, kind of choppy and just, lots of action. So I think that was a big read. I think that kind of lent to it being a quick read was because it, it never had any kind of drawn out world building or anything. It was just action, action, action. So it was great. I loved it. Okay, cool. All right. So what's your number two? My number two is one that I just finished. And I know that you are interested in reading this book too. It's Flame in the Mist by mm-hmm. Renee Adier. And Oh my gosh, I'm still swooning so hard over this book because I just 
we just finished it like yesterday wow. and I can't stop thinking about it. It's like one of those things where I can't move on in my world because my head is still with these characters. Um, oh, you have a book hangover. I do. I have a real <laughs> bad book hangover on it. And the crazy thing is that it is part of a series, which I didn't know. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. No, I didn't realize it until I had like a third of the book left. And I was like, they are really setting up a lot of things and it doesn't look like they're going to have time to close all these holes or all of these things that they're setting up. And then I, I, in the last few chapters, it became really clear that they were setting up a second book, which isn't out yet. So I'm like, ah, I have to wait like a year for this book to come out. It doesn't entirely surprise me because I remember the Wrath and the Dawn was a two-parter. So yes. And people are wondering if this is going to be a uh, like a series or if it's going to be a duology like Wrath and the Dawn and Rose the dagger were so which i haven't yeah. read this have you read those i've read wrath in the dawn yes did you like it i did like it but i gotta say the first book was slow start for me mm-hmm. um but i think that i like the second book better I heard that. I, I watched a little bit about that on YouTube. Uh, and I, I heard that similar sentiment from a lot of people that the first book was a lot of world building and a little slow, but people liked Rose and the Dagger better than Wrath and the Dawn. I picked up both of those books and put them down a ton of times just because they sounded interesting and they have such beautiful covers. Mm-hmm. And then I got Flame in the Mist and read it and it wasn't until I finished and I was reading the author info on the jacket that I was like oh my god I kept picking up these other books by this author and I didn't even realize they were the same author so yeah I'm gonna read them now because I really loved Flame in the Mist um but it's a it's a really cool it's a book that's set in feudal Japan and it follows this uh, girl named Mariko it's a multi-perspective technically but it is mostly contained to the main character which is a girl named Mariko who who is really clever. She's like this kind of a scientist or an inventor, but in historical feudal Japan. So she like invents throwing stars in the course of this book and other kind mm-hmm. of cool, like a smoke bomb and, and these different mm-hmm. kinds of things that are, it's really cool to see a female young character who has a very scientific working mind yeah. um, in a book for, for YA, but she is slated to marry this prince. Um, her convoy as it's delivering her to the, the Royal city is attacked presumably by this band of thieves called the Black Clan. Oh. And she kind of decides, she's kind of sour on the fact that her whole worth has been reduced to marrying, you know, marrying into a good family and, and raising her family social standing instead of the fact that she's really clever and, and, and a good inventor and she has a lot of strength beyond just being marryable as a, as a woman. Yeah. And so she decides she's going to track down this black clan and find out who commissioned this attack on her convoy and who was trying to assassinate her and maybe prove to her family that, that she is really capable of, of holding her own in, in a different sense in the world. Uh, and, and maybe doesn't just need to be married off and forgotten about. And it is really, really, really good. The black clan. If you, I know you like, like the A Court of Thorns and, and Roses series. And I don't mm-hmm. know if you've read any of Leigh Bardugo's like Six of Crows with the Grisha trilogy. No, but I want to because I met her and she's super nice. I'm oh like, oh my I gosh, can't... you met her. I'm so yes. fangirl over her. She's my absolute favorite author of all time. Really? <laughs> oh, she's nice. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it gave me, she has in her books, in its own way, um, very similar though to, to Sarah J. Mass's kind of squad vibe, you mm-hmm. know, where you, and that was definitely present in this book as well, in Flame in the Mist with the Black Clan and all the members there. Um, and I also kind of thought it was similar. Have you read um, Ember in the Ashes from Sabah to Here? No, her? I haven't read it. That one's great, too. Oh, I could have put that one on this list. But I would say those three, if you're fans of of any of those three or all of those three, you probably would really like this book because it is so, so good. And I could probably talk about it for an hour just because it's so fresh in my brain, but I'll stop there. But I (laughs) highly, highly recommend it. It it was such a fun read. I could not put that one down. Okay, so you clearly love that. So what is going to happen when you talk about your number one? Because Oh my gosh, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. But my number one is one that's been out for a while. I think probably a lot of people have read it. So I I won't have to sell it as much, I don't think. 
<laughs> uh, but it is the A Court of uh, Mist and Fury from Sarah J. Mass. I've read this book like six times, and it's like six hundred pages long. So and you guys should know. Just side note: this is the second book in the series. It the is second book, and the second book is so much better than the first. So get uh, through the first, yes, and you will be rewarded. <laughs> I actually really loved the first book of Court of Thorns and Roses, but I have heard that from a lot of people. And a lot of people say that the the middle book, A Court of Mr. Fury, is their favorite in the in the three book series that she's got going now. I know she's adding more to it uh, either next year or the following. But, yeah, I would agree um, but, with that statement. I think yes, the second one was my favorite. It was my favorite too. Yeah. I liked the first one. I liked the third one, but I I could, you know, I don't have to reread those in my life. This one is like my comfort book. I come back to it. It's and it's a huge book. It's a tome. Six hundred and twenty-six so pages of amazingness. <laughs> it's so <laughs> so good. It's got my book boyfriend in it. Yes. Like, so I feel like my, all my book boyfriends, I'll take any one of them. And I'd probably take the girls too. I'll take them all. <laughs> You're like, I'll take them all. I'll just like, just put me in their world. I will, I'll just, I just want to hang out with them. Be oh, best friends with everyone. It's so good. I, know. I belong in the night court. I don't know about you. Oh, yes. I belong there. <laughs> I, could, I could maybe go to the autumn court because I do love Lucian. I just yeah. myself. I loved him from the beginning. Even when he was being a little bit stassy and a little bit meh I was still like come on Lucian I know I know you're a good guy yeah so I would take him I wouldn't want to be around his brothers I guess and I wouldn't ha- want to have to go with him to spring court because of our yeah. friends there so but I think he's kind of Lucian's kind of in the night court now right I want to like, say in, that he's in the group he's like yeah. on the team so <laughs> He that's where he belongs. Put him over there with the cool people. Yeah. The cool people. They were pink on Wednesdays. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, I don't I guess I didn't really say what the book is about, but I'm not gonna just go read it. Like just trust me and Tamworth. Go read the series. It's amazing. <laughs> it is. It's fantasy, you guys. It's Faye and all these fun things. Oh God, You'll so love good. it. If yes. you like fantasy, if you like a little bit of a dash of romance that's not oh, overcooked, but it's totally <laughs> just swoon worthy, just, oh, oh it's amazing. It's so, so good. All yeah. right, so that's my five like books that I couldn't put down when I was reading them. That is definitely one of mine. I mean, I. I, I feel like I read 626 pages so fast. I've oh, never read that so fast. Me either. And the fact, you know, I every time I read this book, it's crazy to me that I've read it as many times as, as I have because it's so long and you would think you'd get sick of it. But you just, Sarah has this way of putting so many Easter eggs in to her books that every time you read them, you're like, oh my God, I didn't even notice before that this is something she set up a few books ago. And I just am in awe of how she can think that far ahead. I can barely think till, you know, tomorrow. So (laughs) she must be like a master plotter. She's plotting Uh, all day. I did read an interview with her where she said that she, at least for the Throne of Glass series, that they have her send detailed synopses and outlines like way ahead of time for this. But that's like a 10 book series or something. So I guess you kind of have to for something like that. But she's uh, she's amazing. She is worth all that money she gets because she's so, so good. (laughs) (laughs) She is. Definitely check out this series, guys. So (laughs) Jennifer's Picks all sound amazing and i think that you won't lose with any of them i I feel like you'll like them yeah i hope so i'm so i'm such a fangirl for all these books so more people (laughs) need to read them so i can you know fangirl about them with you guys (laughs) you know i really love that you are really fangirling that is the best thing ever (laughs) i love that I am. I am like the biggest nerd for books. And I've always been this way since uh, like the moment I could read. I like elementary school, sat or recess reading, you know, and it's a cool world to be a fangirl for books because you have the internet, you have such a big community of people who can join in with you. So even if you're like me and kind of just a lonely nerd in your normal life, talking about things that no one who knows you in person knows anything about, mm-hmm. you can just get online and find lots of people who are just as nerdy as you are. Because you're a fan of books, I know as an author, you know what people like to read. You know what's good. I feel like, you know, I, I try to do, you know, 
the the genre research it and kind of be there um where my my readers are at uh and it it does help to be a big fan of the genre that you're writing in. I think that's kind of key for for writing a book where people can say that you know you were really into it too as a reader, not just a writer as you were going through. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about your novella because yeah. I believe I've heard that it's totally binge worthy as well. So let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about a wild and unremarkable thing. Tell Yay. me a little bit about it. Sure. So this is a fantasy novella. Um, it is the story of a girl named Kada who sets out to slay a dragon, collect her reward, and rescue her sisters from poverty. Uh, and along the way, she's going to meet a prince, she meets a bookworm, she meets a god, and she meets a lot of bloodthirsty creatures too. So she's on her way to, to slay this dragon and hopefully reap a reward that will get her sisters out of destitution. Mm. Okay, so... Being that this is in the this is in the YA arena, right? Yeah, I would call it older spectrum YA, bordering on new adult. The characters are, um, for the most part, nineteen twenty, and there are a few more, uh, romantically speaking, some more mature scenes um, peppered in there. So I would say it's a little bit more older spectrum YA um, or or new adult. Okay, I bet it falls in kind of the realm of the books we were previously talking yeah. about where it has some adult <laughs> things going on, but yeah. you know, it's not out of control. <laughs> Yeah, it's never. It's not to like the a guitar level. <laughs> no, it's not super innocent <laughs> either. I would definitely not call it like a middle grade book. You know, yeah. it's a little bit older than that. <laughs> awesome. Well, this is a novella, and just for the people that are listening out there, really quickly, um, I know that some, you know, a lot of my listeners are readers, but not everyone knows what a novella is versus a standard length book. So, can you just give a little feedback on why yours is a novella? Sure. Yeah. Well, a novella um, used to kind of be the norm. First of all, a lot of people don't realize that books like The Outsiders and The Chronicles of Narnia and The Great Gatsby um, would all be considered novellas by today's kind of word count standards. But the market today, the norm for a novel is is much longer. So a novella is going to be about half the length or, or a little more than half the length of your typical novel. Mm -hmm. um, for YA. And um, it's uh, the reason I, I wanted to, to paint this one as, as a novella instead of a novel is that you just construct them differently. It's, it's a little bit of a different art form. It's um, much more concise. Every sentence really uh, has to serve something to the plot and to the overall story. Um, and you just, it's just a different way of, of constructing a story uh, kind of Similar to if you're painting like a realistic portrait compared to an abstract, you just approach them differently, mm -hmm. um, but it, it could be the same, the same kind of a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was something that I started off with as sort of a writing exercise. I was working on a different piece at the time, and I was a little bit in a, a writing slump, similar to being in like a reading slump. Uh, and when that happens to me, I like to do writing exercises, and there are also things that I, I do in between um, writing books as well to just keep my creative muscles strong is working on these writing exercises. So I decided to approach a lot of different technical aspects, but one of them was to write um, a novella and, and to construct it as a novella from the get-go instead of um, constructing it as a novel. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really expect it to spanned much beyond you know just something for my own personal enjoyment and something to kind of rev my my engine and get me back on track with this other piece that has since been kind of relegated to the drawers yeah. but it just turned into something really quickly that I was obsessed with I couldn't stop writing it and I realized pretty early on that I was going to finish it and it was uh, going to be something that I thought was pretty special and I I'm still so hype on this book. I, <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. I love all the characters. And I, I had so much fun writing it. And it's really, it was very nerve wracking to put it out there in the world because it was something I loved so much. So the, the positive 
feedback and the, the good reception that it's been getting on Goodreads with the early reviewers that have been posting a lot of um, early reviews up there has mm -hmm. been really, really special for me to see because I was so nervous that mm -hmm. it was just going to be something that I loved so much, but maybe that maybe everyone else didn't love it as much. It's yeah. nice to see that people are enjoying it. That's always <laughs> the risk you take, but the payoff, the reward is great when you take the risk, right? Uh, it hasn't for this one. It's, it's, I can't even express what a relief it is as, as an author to that people to like what you write. It's so hard. It's so scary to put it out there. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about um, the squad in your book. Okay. So we sure. talked about squads a little bit with another series earlier. So yeah. what's the squad in your book? What's going on with that? <laughs> So the squad in my book, we've got uh, we've got a pretty colorful cast of characters. They're all very different, as I I think they they have to be in a novella because you're you don't have a lot of time and a lot of nuances to set people apart. So you have to have characters that are very distinctly their own. Um, but we've got Kada, who I talked about, who is our our warrior going off to slay this dragon and save her sisters. And um, we've got our a crown prince named Fares, who is this very snarky uh, character who has a great heart, but he's also really, really funny. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got his best friend, Wolfgang, who is um, a lover of books, but maybe not the best candidate to slay a dragon. But he's going, he's going also into these mountains to slay a dragon to, to kind, uh, sorry, to kind of get a sense of personal autonomy and, mm -hmm. and get some uh, personal glory. His friend, the prince, is just kind of along for the ride there. And then we've got Pen, who is um, our god, our death god in this book, who is a kind of a sinister character, um, who I won't go too much into to what his role is, but they all kind of converge on this path towards the summer alps where they're going to slay these dragons. And from there, um, go into the, the mountains and, and we see what happens to each one of them on this quest. Okay. Well, so now I've got to know, which of these characters are your favorite and why? <laughs> oh, gosh. My absolute favorite is the prince. Fares is his name. And he, I had so much fun writing him. He is uh, kind of the comic relief, which I, is always kind of my favorite in the book, in a book when I'm reading. I love the, especially the male character that makes me laugh and is just kind of snarky and, and devil may care kind of character, but who you know is, is a, uh, a good kind person just underneath the surface there. Um, and that's, that's who I tried to make bears into. And I had so much fun writing him and um, the scenes where I had to maybe not be the kindest to him as an author. I really struggled writing them oh, because no. I loved him so much. I just, he was my friend. I wanted to keep him in this little safe bubble, but I couldn't. Yeah. Um, but he was by far my favorite. He has, uh, he's a secondary character. And so he does have a romantic arc that takes place later in the book and and um i really really liked his romantic arc too i like the the person that he ends up with they're i think a really um funny complimentary pair mm -hmm. and he was my favorite right and then i i love kata my heroine she she's just um oh gosh i wanted to say a bad ASS, but I don't know, Tamara. <laughs> it's okay. Shed? We're all adults here. And it's not that bad of a word. You're okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. She's just a badass. And she, she is, oh gosh, I, I have such a sympathy with her character. She has kind of this cool vibe with animals. And, and I have spent um, many years working in animal welfare field. So I kind of peppered that into her character. And I just, I love her. I think she's tragic. I think she's really strong. Mm -hmm. And people, I, I've been really pleased that her character has resonated with a lot of people, male and female readers as well. Mm -hmm. um, she is having kind of an identity struggle through this book, uh, because in order to go slay this dragon, if she wants to reap the reward, she does have to stay in the guise of a boy um, mm. for her whole life. If it's, fine, if it's found out that she is a, a girl even after she's reaped a reward, it can be revoked. Um, and so she has spent her whole life kind of ready to, to sacrifice this sense of personal identity in order to save her family and, and 
rescue them from poverty. Uh, but by the time she's ready to go after this dragon, she's at a place where she would be kind of blossoming as a woman. And she spends a lot of the book isolating these two selves into a masculine and a feminine self and kind of trying to smother one, but it keeps, you know, jutting its head up and, and it takes her the course of the book to really realize that, you know, she's, she's all these parts of herself. She's mm. not something that's defined to, to one label. And um, that was a major theme in the book. And, and I was really happy that it, uh, it spoke to, to some of these early reviewers because it was pretty close to my heart. You know, we're mm -hmm. whole people. We, we don't have to be labels if we don't want to be. Um, and that was a big, a big part of her journey. So, yeah. so she, I would say she and Fares were my, my favorite ones to write in the Christmas book, but I love them all. Even the ones that are, um, you know, not meant to be the most likable characters were really awesome. fun to write. So how much time <laughs> has passed in a wild and unremarkable, can't speak, in a wild and unremarkable <laughs> thing. How much time has passed? Because, you know, you mentioned her going through these phases in life and that she's like kind of hidden herself yeah. this whole time. So do we get to experience her yeah. growing up? Is it that much in the novella? Um, not so much. We do get um, a, a small prologue, just a couple of, of pages of a prologue. And then we, we have some allusions to her past throughout the course of the book. Um, but it's not until she leaves her village where she's lived, you know, her whole life and she's setting out and she kind of gets some distance from her family and from this um, immediate sense of duty that she's always had, that she starts to uh, embrace her kind of feminine side more than she ever had has in the past. So we're seeing that she um, really had resigned herself to this one, what she thinks of as a, as a mm -hmm. disguise. Um, and, and this is her first kind of experience of, of these, these selves both emerging simultaneously and, and how she, um, how she's navigating through that. And it, it takes her the whole course of the book really to come to terms uh, in the epilogue with, with who she is now. But the book itself just takes place over the course. Oh gosh. Now I have to think back over my timeline, but not too long, maybe a couple of weeks as they're traveling to the mountains and then mm -hmm. up into the mountains to, to slay these dragons. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a kind of a short timeline, which um, yeah. It's a novella, so right. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you sound like you're tackling some pretty serious themes and maybe some complicated things underneath in such a short amount of pages. Yeah. So how'd you do that? Like, how'd you get comfortable with that short amount of time to fill in all this, you know, information? <laughs> yeah, I think that that is just one of the beauties of writing a novella is that you do have to make every single um, sentence count every everything every metaphor every simile it it means something the colors all have a purpose there's a lot of symbolism involved and everything is driven toward what your central themes are and what uh, and what your plot is so there's no extraneous information which is fun in a full length novel and I I love reading a full length just as much as I, I love reading a novella but they're just constructed differently and um, and you have characters that all have very clear uh, or at least in this piece they all have very clear goals there's not a lot of muddying mm -hmm. around so it does give you room to explore some things that are deeper because you're not um at least in this piece I wasn't worried about you know Kata deciding if she was or if she wasn't going to go into these mountains or, or anything like that they're set on their course uh, and and that kind of concrete uh, goal is already established for them they're they're heading pretty on pretty straight lines towards it so I got to have a, a lot more um, freedom to work with these abstract themes and, and those kind of abstract that's awesome goals. because um like if anyone that listens to my podcast or reads the blog, they know that there are two things, well, three things that I love in a story. I love a strong heroine. <laughs> I love when it, the plot is tight. I don't like a lot of wasted space yeah. and pages where you can skip. Right? <laughs> like, let me skip the pages because yeah. this was just wasted. <laughs> and, and I love a realistic <laughs> ending. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think you I hope you would like this one that I feel like it probably satisfies all of that criteria. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just not room in a novella for a lot mm -hmm. of info dump. So I think um, a lot of world building is really beautiful. And, and for some people, that is their thing. If you like, you know, Lord of the Rings, if you like, like, what a new what's a newer one, like, I feel like, um, 
the Red Queen mm -hmm. series. That one has a lot of great, beautiful, drawn out world building. And some people really, really love that. And it takes a, a lot of skill to write it. But if, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't like um, to know all of those details. They just want to get to, to the, right. the meat of the matter. And I think if you are one of those people that a novella might be, you know, a, a good um, read for you because you can get through it pretty quickly. Which makes it perfect for binging. <laughs> It's yes. great for binging. It's great for, you know, if you have a going on holidays and you have a plane ride, you just want a plane read or um, if it's, you know, when summer finally rolls back around, if you need a beach read or something that you can kind of read quickly, a novella is great. Or if you're just someone who likes a concise yeah. read, uh, that's that's a novella yeah. for you. So give, they're coming back into trends. A lot of uh, big, big authors are, are doing companion novels or, or writing them. And so I think we're going to be seeing more of them on kind of the mainstream shelves. I'm hoping, you know, in the next few years, it seems to be turning back towards them a little bit. So I definitely love full length novels. And I like companion novellas, like you were saying, I especially mm -hmm. in a series, yeah. it's a great way to fill, you know, other characters out or kind of Large gaps, oh like what gosh, happened? Yes. Or if you just like, uh, I mean, if you're having a book hangover, like I mm -hmm. am, flame the mist right now. I wish there was a companion novel yeah, for that one. Exactly. <laughs> like it tied me over with these characters. So yeah, I'm with you. Awesome. I love that too. Okay, so. All right, so we know that your book is coming out in just a few short weeks. So everyone, Jennifer's links are all below. You can find her all over social media. You can even pre-order A Wild and Unremarkable Thing on Amazon. The link is below down there as well. Jennifer, is there anything else you would like to share with us either about your novella or what you're working on right now before we sign off for the night? Um, not really. I feel like we've covered so much. This has been so fun. Um, the, uh, the Amazon pre-order link is on a special discount right now. It's only 99 cents to pre-order the ebook right now. So I would say hop on that. Um, that's not going to last forever. And, um, you can get on the Goodreads link and read a lot of these early reviews from, um, the wonderful bloggers and early readers who have had an advanced copy. But otherwise, uh, I think we, we covered at all and I've had a lot of fun talking to you and, and talking about all these yes it's with been you. a pleasure it was so much fun thank you for taking the time to join me tonight it was just wonderful all right thanks Tamara Oh, no problem. So thank you much, everyone, for spending this time with Jennifer and I tonight here on Book Chat. Thank you for streaming and downloading all that fun stuff. And as always, happy reading. Take care, everyone. If you enjoyed today's Book Chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading.